We've lost two of our panellists. Yeah. We're behind I don't know. We've, we've, we've only gone 15 metres and we've lost two of our panellists. <laughs> they never made it out of the room. Oh, right, OK. Yeah. All right. Well, I will start introducing the event slowly while we round up Moira and Rachel. OK. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor, the RSA's Chief Executive. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening for this special event to launch the RSA's Future Work Centre, an event you will remember forever because you will say that was the event I went to the night before England reached the World Cup final. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Always a populist. Um, <laughs> Uh, and also, uh, as Ian made me promise, it finishes at 6.59 so that you can go and watch the real World Cup final downstairs uh, over drinks. So, um, uh, welcome to the RSA. Before we begin, a quick reminder to turn your mobile phone to silent. Hi, Moya. Hi, Rachel. Uh, we're filming tonight's event and live streaming over the web, so welcome to everyone joining us online. And a reminder that the hashtag is RSA Future Work if you'd like to get involved in the discussion on uh, Twitter. We do, do want to hear from as many people as possible on how you feel about the new machine age and how it's changing the world of work, whether that's the work you do personally or the organizations you're part of, or perhaps you're thinking ahead to how your job will change uh, in the future. One of the startling findings in research we published today is how pessimistic so a lot of people are about what's going to happen to the nature of their job over the next few years, all the kinds of careers your children should be preparing for. Does automation, artificial intelligence, this whole new world of work, new technology, new platforms point to a future to fear or to welcome? Can we harness the opportunities it offers and mitigate the risks to create better quality work for more people? These are some of the questions at the heart of a new program of work that will be carried out by the RSA under the roof of our new Future Work Centre, which we launched tonight with the support of our partners, Friends Provident Foundation, Google.org, Taylor Wessing, and a generous donation from an RSA fellow. So I'd like to take this opportunity to say a sincere thank you to uh, them. Without them, we wouldn't be here tonight and we wouldn't be embarking on this fascinating program. To mark the centre's launch tonight, we're delighted to be joined by an expert panel to share their insights with us on the key question of how we best prepare today's workforce for tomorrow's workplace. Joining us, we have Azim Azar, who's an entrepreneur, investor, and creator of the influential weekly newsletter Exponential View, which is an essential read for anyone interested in technology's impact on society now and in the future. Moya Green, who as Chief Executive of the Royal Mail Group has steered the company through a period of deep transformation over the last eight years, a process that has involved the embrace of e-commerce, major investment in new technologies, and of course the challenges of supporting a large workforce through change. Uh, Antonia Bantz, who is Head of Campaigns and Communications at the TUC, we were on a platform just this afternoon. We didn't, never met each other before, and now we've been on a platform twice in two hours. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, Antonia is Head of Campaigns and Communications at the TUC, and she's leading the union's work on how artificial intelligence will impact workers, and of course, needless to say, campaigning to protect jobs and rights throughout this period of disruption and change. And finally, last but not least, Rachel Reeves, MP. Rachel is an economist, she's Labour MP for Leeds West, and she's Chair of the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Select Committee. The committee has just launched an inquiry on automation and the future of work, looking at its likely impact on UK businesses and the potential it has for productivity, growth, and re-industrialization. That's not an easy word to say. Um, so we've got a wealth of expertise across the panel. They're each going to speak for just five minutes, which is deeply unfair, because they could each speak for an hour, but they're going to speak for just five minutes. I'm going to try and have, get them to have an argument between each other, um, because it's a warm evening uh, for a few minutes, and then we're going to open it up to you before we finish at 6.59, so that Zim can run downstairs. Is Belgium or France you'll be rooting for? Uh, Belgium. Okay, today. very yeah. good. All right, so uh, without further ado, Azim, over to you. Thank you, Matthew. It's a real honor to, to be here. I've been very impressed with how the RSA has been researching uh, this area and artificial intelligence. I spend many hours watching some of the lectures uh, on YouTube. And I should add that I'm a student of technology rather than an evangelist. And, and what I try to do is describe what I see and understand the emergent properties of technology rather than uncritically lauding the next smartphone app or update to Fortnite. Uh, the topic of what happens to work is so rich and deep that I just want to perhaps do some, some level setting and really start that off with three lines of attack. Uh, the first is that the change in technology that we see in, in businesses and consumer technology really is coming more quickly and faster. Uh, than the historical average of the last 200 years. We see that read about, written about a lot in the papers, but, but it seems to be true. And, and we know this because there are a range of independent technologies, whether it's processing power for computation or the price to sequence a human genome or the decline in price of lithium-ion batteries, 
that are all improving at high double-digit percentage compound rates every year. We also see it because over the last 30 years, we've built an infrastructure of global supply chains, just-in-time manufacturing, and commerce systems that allows new in innovations, even non-digital ones, to go global in days, not in years. And for those digital products, those cu cultural artifacts, can go global and reach hundreds of millions of people in even shorter timeframes. And when we look at how quickly companies can create value, we've seen a, an incredible improvement. Um, historically, it took about 24 years for a, a US public company to go from founding to achieve a $1 billion valuation. Uh, Facebook, which was founded in 2004, took four and a half years. Snapchat, founded in 2009, took two years to get to a billion dollar valuation. And Bird, a scooter company, founded in 2017, took about a year. And then we get to China. And in China, Ant Financial, which is only four years old, is now valued at $150 billion. So if anyone says the world is moving faster than before, well, on many metrics, I think they're absolutely right, and it's not going to slow down. So the second line is, is, this, is that it's important to, to have an understanding of what type of technology changes are ineluctable or, or inevitable. There's sometimes a view that if we regulated harder or didn't reward mercurial founders, these changes wouldn't take place so quickly, that there would be no dominant social network without Mark Zuckerberg. And, and I think that this view is misheld, and it's misheld because we often portray in the media these technology entrepreneurs as Tony Stark-like characters. No Tony Stark, no Iron Man. Uh, but that's not really how technologies have come to be over the past couple of million years. Um, they arise out of the social interactions and cultural interchange, and we build on these ideas and the ideas of, of others. The myth of a genius inventor is just a nice story that is easy for the media to pick up on, but it doesn't capture the notion that technological advancement emerges as a result of our increasingly complex interactions with each other. The third sort of line of attack is this notion of exceptionalism. And, and exceptionalism is something that we've grown up with, um, particularly within the Western tradition, that we're somehow special, fashioned from God's hand, or that our planet is the center of the universe. Um, in current debate, we, 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 show, we think about work as a, in, a, the way we have it today as something that it's exceptional, that we have it within this um, pseudo-liberal democracy, it's a paid position of regular employment. And I think we sometimes in the debate argue that that's the zenith of how we should organize ourselves. But it isn't the case. The word job only dates from the 16th century. The word job as it means full-time paid employment is more recent than that. And perhaps it's uncomfortable to acknowledge that we aren't that exceptional and we face changes to the conventions that we grew up with. Um, you know, when we think of widely available full-time well-paid employment when enshrined work rights and pensions, I think it's a mistake to think that these are jewels that are going to remain um, with us. So my short level setting is the change is happening very quickly. Many of those changes are what complexity scientists would call emergent properties. They happen, they arise, they're not driven by individual geniuses. Um, and we should perhaps realize that our position in society today, 2018, is not an exceptional one. We're not unique amongst humans to face change. We, we sort of need to get to that ex uh, acceptance. So then very briefly, what do these changes mean? Well, they mean there is automation um, driven by AI, and it's happening very, very fast. Uh, the return of invest on investment for somebody automating a business process in the back office of a bank or an insurance company can be less than a year. Uh, that means it's very attractive for businesses. We're also starting to see the platformization of work, which means gig working and coordination platforms like a Deliveroo and an Uber growing in the areas in which they, in which they operate. And we're also starting to see companies that accumulate the rewards to very, very few. The median salary in Facebook is $240,000 a year, so one in two Facebook employees earns more than that. Uh, so you're seeing a tremendous rise in inequality in the performance of these so-called superstar firms. But does that mean that there's nothing that can be done in the face of all of this? And I think there absolutely are things that we can do. I mean, policies do make a difference, and they make a difference the world over. But I think you have to lay them out in the context of those three themes. Otherwise, you're, you're like King Canute's advisors. There's no point advising him that the tide won't come in. The tide is coming in, so you either have to move to higher ground or build some boats. I'll give some examples um, of what those might be very, very briefly. So uh, one is, I think, uh, the importance of changing the narrative away from the hero founder and the exceptional technology talent into realizing that technology advancement is a social good that emerges out of social investment. The second is we can start to build some boats. 
for example, how do we acknowledge the arrival of new classes of work on gig platforms and create the policies and the products, for example, pay-as-you-go insurance, that support, support the people who make their living that way? How do we deal with the platform monopolies that we've seen the Googles and the Facebooks and the Netflixes, but there are going to be more? These AI businesses tend towards monopoly. We don't have good regulation that allows us to, to deal with it. And how can we start to encourage companies, either by social pressure or by legislation, to declare a training dividend that it emerges as a result of the costs they save through automation? Our tax and education system needs to change as well. We, I don't have time to discuss that. It's great that we're having this debate here because I, I want them to be, this, these debates to be out in the open. Um, there is a new realization about what these new work modalities are. That realization is finally coming home. Thank you. Um, so, Moya, I, I just got a little frisson from you when uh, Azim said we mustn't assume that the reasonably well-paid job with rights and entitlements and pensions is something that is here to stay because your battle has been to modernize in a company that still has a commitment to precisely that kind of model. Have you been fighting a losing or a winning battle? I don't think so. I don't think I'm fighting a losing battle at all, Matthew. I think uh, all good employers have got to fight that battle because there's one thing about change that I have learned in my 64 years is that people resist it. Mm -hmm. And they have amazing tools of resistance. Mm -hmm. And um, if they're organized, the tools are just magnified greatly. Um, people don't like to change the way in which they have done things and even if the general welfare benefits are very clear, even if you know, prices will largely come down, uh, convenience will go up, uh, the scale of these technologies and the impact that they are going to have and they are already having on the task array that is inside jobs and on jobs themselves, whole categories of jobs. I mean, who amongst us right now, I think, if we had a child in, in university studying medicine would say, oh, go into pathology, because in 15 years' time, that's probably a discipline that uh, will have so radically changed that um, it's probably not a wise choice. The other thing I would say is that um, managers consistently overstate their ability to manage change. And um, we do not do it well on, on either side. So we've got, in my case, uh, with, with Royal Mail, I think our people have been incredibly adaptive to a huge amount of change over the past eight years. And that is thanks to the union, on the one hand, because we have some very intelligent people in our union who understand that certain of these changes are just inevitable and that we either help people through them and one of the tools, and I think a very important tool if you're an employer to help people through them, is to deal with the insecurity mm -hmm. that is coming and uh, from many of these changes. So in delivery, which is my business, we have, sadly, uh, as part of you know, normal efficiency, we have 20,000 fewer people in our company today relative to eight or nine years ago. 20,000 fewer. Where did they go? Tens of thousands of new jobs have been created in delivery, but they have been created in delivery in their very poor jobs, in my opinion. They are totally lacking in security. And eventually, the union movement, the trade union movement, just like the uh, independent trade union movement that is there here in the UK today, they're going to figure out how to organize those people. And then there will be real resistance to these changes. So my message uh, today is that Yes, I think technologies over a long period of time have shown themselves to be very beneficial uh, to society on balance. The process by which we adapt to them, though, we have always been overconfident. We need to do as we're doing here this evening, talk about change to help people understand that even individually it's probably not horrible for them. And the first thing that you have to do to get people to accept that is to protect their incomes, protect their benefits so that they can actually make the changes in their jobs without feeling that um, they're going to lose in terms of looking after their families. And finally, you know, just because we change technologies and we create uh, a bunch of new jobs, it doesn't mean that we won't have still lots of boring jobs. These platform technologies create very many boring jobs and the whole idea of how to make a boring job uh, better 
is something that uh, we have a, a, a lot of thinking to do. Who amongst us would want to be a Deliveroo driver forever and a day? I don't think very many. All right, thank you. Uh, so, Antonia, uh, Moya mentioned trade unions, the role of trade unions. One of the slightly depressing uh, statistics come out of the research that we published today is we asked people the question, to what extent do you think each of the following institutions are well prepared or not well prepared to protect workers from the effects of new technologies? And unions were 18% very well prepared. So technology companies are 37%, employers 36%. So the public is not yet convinced that trade unions are on top of this show the public they're wrong. Well, and um, I think one of the jobs of a trade unionist on a panel a little bit like this one is uh, to talk about how things are, not always how, how we would wish things to be. So I would say that there are a number of our unions that really are engaging uh, with new technology, um, with the way that we need to bargain to ensure that uh, the shares uh, that go to workers of any productivity gains are maximised. Um, and Moya has already spoken about one of them, our, our communications workers, the CWU, who have done such an excellent job uh, of making sure that they didn't put their workforce at the Royal Mail through a situation where they would see their pay go down. Um, and actually what the maintenance of their pay levels whilst the cutting of hours alongside the adoption of new technology um, is a sign of how well um, that trade union has been prepared to negotiate with an employer who were committed to not bringing in the type of precarious work uh, that we've heard described. I mean, more broadly, I don't, I don't really need to tell this audience uh, about how, ba how bad work is for many people in this country uh, and about how much we'd like it to be better. I'll take that as read. Just one stat for you. Uh, we're, we're in the longest wage squeeze since Napoleonic times, and the average wage has yet to recover to the level that it was before the crash 10 years ago this summer. Um, so whatever happens with the advent of technology, whether it be changed jobs, fewer jobs, more jobs, what we need to do is make sure that the way that tech is implemented happens with workers' consent and understanding, that the gains are shared, and wherever possible, life at work gets better. And I'm an unashamed champion, as you would expect, of permanent paid secure jobs with benefits. And I'd like to see us have more of them rather than less. In order for that to happen, we need to raise employment standards and put more resources into enforcement. I'd like to see an end to zero hours contracts. People, they are on the decline, but we still have more than 900,000 of our fellow citizens not sure whether they'll make enough money this month to make the rent, and that to me seems unacceptable. Um, we need to end the rules that allow agency workers to be paid less than the permanent worker they sit next to doing the same job. And we need to ban bogus self-employment. Uh, we heard about the delivery industry, and of course, one of our unions has just won a really landmark case against the delivery operator Hermes, who were using exactly this model, pretending that people wearing their uniforms, driving their vans on a schedule set by them, um, were self-employed when they clearly were not. And I'm very, very glad to see that that has happened. Um, it also means that we do need stronger trade unions to force employers to negotiate over the implementation of tech in the workplace. Uh, unions that are able to advocate for working people at the sharp end of new tech, bargaining on how it's used at work, negotiating on how we reskill workers when that's needed, and arguing for new good jobs for those at risk from automation and AI. Now, there are a number of ways in which we need to get, uh, we, we need to facilitate stronger unions and I, I would argue that it is both for unions themselves to get better at organising and I lead a project at the TUC to build a new digital union for 21 to 30s in the private sector um, and I'd love to tell you some more about it so do ask me a question but I only have five minutes now. Um, plus we need some legal changes uh, to fix the obstacles that make it more difficult for workers to organise. We should have the right to go into workplaces during working hours, for example. Um, we should be able to organise in sectors um, where employers are forced to sit down with us and negotiate a new floor rate for wages, for skills levels and for conditions, particularly in low paid sectors. And of course we need to use our imagination and start planning on how we can use tech to improve working lives. 
Six in ten workers in a piece of research that the TUC will publish in the next couple of weeks, six in ten feel that workplace surveillance through technology is fueling distrust and discrimination in their workplace. And over half of UK workers tell us that they're being monitored. They think they're being monitored by their boss at work. That's hardly the new bright future that we were all promised through technology. We should start to think about the jobs that we don't want there to be done in the economy of the future. Let's start with getting rid of some of those dirty and dangerous jobs that don't pay enough to live on and think about how we can use tech to make the most of our human resources and provide care for our ageing population. We, can, we need to think about how we can use technology to provide for the flexible working that so many people tell us they're crying out for. I sat in a focus group of uh, young dads, private sector dads under 30, uh, in Coventry recently, and they were so angry, it had to be heard to be believed, about the number of school assemblies and sports days that they had to miss. They wanted to be brilliant dads, and their jobs got in the way. The scheduling of their jobs when they didn't have any notice about when they were going to be working got in the way of them being the dads they wanted to be. And good work has to listen to those people who have other responsibilities and want to balance what's going on in the rest of their lives. And finally, um, PwC tell us that uh, AI could lead to a 10% boost in UK productivity by 2030. I'm sure you'll agree, a much needed boost to our productivity. Productivity boost gives us choices in how we share the proceeds of that boost. I'm a trade unionist. We campaign for the same things for the last 200 years. It's more money and it's more time. And so we need to think about how we balance the interests of workers uh, and reward them that they share in the gains of productivity through more money, through increased wages, and more time through more time off. Perhaps we'll even see the day when those gains could start helping us bring the retirement age back down again. And finally, Rachel, and it's very good of you, Rachel, to come here because there's a lot going on uh, in your workplace. There seems to be an accelerating turnover of jobs taking place uh, uh, there. I don't think there's anything to, I'm not sure there's anything to do with technology. Um, or productivity. Or productivity. <laughs> comes um, I guess for you, and I've read some of the stuff you've written about this, the challenge is what, what is the progressive response to, on the one hand, unleashing the potential of technology while at the same time protecting the interests of ordinary working families? Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to come and speak on the panel today, Matthew. I think that the role of policymakers, really, uh, progressives and, and all of us um, making policy in Parliament, is to try and keep up with the changing place of work and put in place the institutional reforms and uh, institutional systems uh, to provide better protection, uh, some of the points that Antonia uh, made, but also, um, as was made by um, Azim, to take advantage of the opportunities, and, and, uh, and Moira as well, to take advantage of the opportunities. And I think that policymakers have been pretty bad at keeping up and delivering that institutional change. And Matthew's too modest to mention, but it's a year ago uh, tomorrow that you published your report for the government on good work. And when it was published uh, last July, the Prime Minister uh, uh, came out and, and, and gave, a, gave a speech about uh, how important Matthew's work was. In and this room. In, in this room. <laughs> and a year on, there has been no policy development or policy proposals from government to take forward any of uh, Matthew's recommendations. And my select committee, along with Frank Field's Work and Pensions uh, Select Committee, uh, took evidence from uh, some of the companies that uh, Antonia has mentioned, uh, as well as uh, from, from Matthew and other commissioners. And although there's going to be political disagreement about uh, whether um, the report went far, far enough and whether uh, uh, more could have been done to protect workers, or uh, some members who, uh, and some people who, who might think it goes too far, I think there is a, a, a view and a belief and a consensus in Parliament and in the country that we need uh, institutional uh, reform and change to keep up with the changing 
nature of work and to deal with some of those issues around bogus self-employment, around zero hours or short hour contracts, to keep up with the technological change to ensure that the tax revenue keeps coming in uh, through uh, 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 income tax and national insurance, uh, but also to give workers the protections that I think that most of us would take for granted and believe should continue, that if you go to work uh, but you um, become uh, ill or disabled, that you get some sort of uh, sickness cover. If you have uh, a baby, you are entitled to maternity or paternity uh, uh, leave. If your child has got um, a, a school concert or a sports day, not that you should just be able to take time off, but you should be able to take paid leave to do those things, as well as to go on a holiday. Uh, and I think it's very disappointing that the government haven't responded to, uh, to, to Matthew's report properly. And it does, I think, beg the question whether these wider reforms in the labour market that we were talking about this evening will meet the same sort of response and inertia from government that we've seen on the, in some ways, more limited reforms that we've seen uh, through some of the tech um, uh, platforms and the growth in, in self-employment over the last few years. I, I think by the next general election, although if it's in the autumn, this might not be true, but I think if the next general election is five years after the last one, uh, then there might be more people, there's likely to be more people in our economy who are self-employed compared with working for the public sector. Mm -hmm. And we've got to keep pace with that changing world of work and we're just not as policy uh, makers for a whole variety of reasons so what do I think that that institutional change will uh, look like I, I want to do more than a list but it probably won't be much more than a list given the, the time uh, available um, I, I think that in terms of skills that's probably the most important uh, uh, area so what is the role of universities in this changing labor market uh, is it appropriate that people go to university between the ages of 18 and 21 and then spend the next 50 years in the labour market. Uh, what is the role for universities, for further educational colleges, uh, for community centres, for lifelong learning to ensure that people can't just, don't just change job but potentially change careers several times uh, during their working lives because whether or not the retirement age uh, comes down as Antonia uh, would like it to do, the reality is that in all those years in, in the labour force with the labour uh, market and the world of work changing as Azim has mentioned as quickly as it is, we need to uh, ensure that people have the skills. And that is a mixture of the soft skills, which I think would likely to become more important uh, in a world where more jobs can be automated, uh, as well as the, the, the tech skills, but also opportunities around artisan skills uh, uh, for bespoke goods and services that, um, that, that come with the new opportunities and potentially uh, the, the greater productivity and incomes uh, that you might have in some parts of the economy uh, with um, with these new opportunities. Um, what else? Trade unions. Trade unions are a really important institution in the changing world of work because we need to ensure that uh, what we don't see, well, what I don't want to see, is the, uh, the, the share of our income going to labour falling, as it has been over the last few years, and also within that labour share, more of the rewards going to those people at the top with those uh, um, uh, niche uh, uh, skills and those valued skills, whereas uh, um, those people doing the jobs that, uh, that people have spoken about, the delivery jobs that uh, uh, Moira has spoken about, uh, getting very uh, low uh, returns for, for their labour. So the role of trade unions in ensuring that workers have that bargaining power, I think, is a crucial uh, institution. Another crucial institution is the social insurance system uh, that we have. I don't want to see uh, people become unemployed and then stuck on disability benefits or out-of-work benefits. I want a social insurance system that provides a transition perhaps through that skills and retraining to ensure that people can then access the new jobs that I think will be created uh, within this fourth industrial revolution. But you need a social insurance uh, system to manage that transition and give people that support and, and, and skill base uh, to, to move on within the, uh, the, the labour market. Just uh, two more things that I think are, are really important, and that is, and it, ha it hasn't been mentioned, but the, uh, the tendency to monopoly that you might see uh, in a world of, of, of greater technology, and we're already seeing that with some of the platforms, whether it is uh, Amazon or Uber or Deliveroo or Facebook, uh, that tendency to monopoly that I think you're more likely to see uh, in a world of, 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 of big data and, and new technologies, and also what happens to tax revenue. Uh, what 
what happens to tax revenue as things uh, uh, become uh, digitized and, and, and things move uh, potentially uh, offshore, and the physical infrastructure that you have of shops on high streets uh, and, uh, and all of that uh, disappear and are replaced uh, with, uh, with, with automated and, 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 and big computers uh, rather than people uh, doing jobs or buildings in which they work. So I think the issue of monopolies and ensuring that we bring in the tax revenue to pay for the public services that we're still going to uh, need in this changing uh, world of work are also important issues uh, that involve uh, the need for new innovative policy making, which I fear at the moment uh, the government are too distracted uh, to deliver on. Um, I'm promised a response before the recess, but we shall see. Um, <laughs> Uh, I always say that, Matthew. Yeah, I know. I, know. <laughs> I used to say that when I was in Goldman's. Anyway, um, uh, so, panel, I've got so many questions, but I want to bring the, the audience in. So, what I'm going to do is, is, is just ask you two or three questions, but just give us a really kind of, I know it won't be a comprehensive response, but just a quick response. So the first thing I want to ask about, and I'll start with you, Moira, is, is that we've actually commendably, I think, talked mainly about people at, at the bottom end, people with the fewest qualifications, the worst pay, the worst conditions, and, and that's as it should be. But actually, I've spent quite a lot of time talking about work, um, and I've spent most of my time at conferences that are actually around how do you recruit, retain, and motivate you know, what is called talent, whatever that means. So obviously, the room is full of it. Um, I'm kind of interested in what, what does technological change mean for organizations uh, as they think not just about how do you protect people, as it were, on the front line and not the shop floor, but also how is it you recruit, retain, and motivate the kinds of people you need with the kinds of skills that you need? Well, you definitely have uh, a different approach today than you did, say, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, my daughter's generation wants a different deal from work and has a different expectation of work than I had. And so, you know, you have to be pretty adaptive uh, at the higher end. And of course, by definition, these are, skills are sought by everybody and there aren't a sufficient number of them right now. We are getting better. We're, you know, setting up new learning institutions to try to create uh, people that have got more computer science skills than we currently have today. But really, that is a 10 or 15 year proposition, I think, before we're going to radically see change. But the other point that I wanted to make, Matthew, and, and uh, I uh, pretty well agreed with everything that I have heard on this panel, but it's not as hard as we think to help people cope with change. We have the policies. They are not being applied. We, you know, we're asking poor little individuals to go to tribunal after tribunal to do what we know is the case and should and is caught by uh, regulatory policy today. We have, you know, we, we, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. We, we should be taking that new, you know, case law that is now being just repeated over and over again to say, look, this is how we are going to interpret the laws that are currently on the books. There are tax laws on the books. We do have to pay national insurance as employers. It is totally unfair competition for half the people in my industry by definitional slate of hand to get away with not paying national insurance taxation. For us, that's a 500 million pound differential right there, one company. So I, I think it's not as hard as we think. We know we don't need right now a whole battery of new policies. We need to enforce the ones we have. And finally, the thing I would uh, ask of Antonia is, I agree with you that institutional uh, you know, apparatus is very important and unions are a crucial part of the infrastructure that will help people cope with change. But the rate of unionization in the United Kingdom has been coming down, down, down. And for the sector of people that we're talking about, those that are displaced from the good jobs and put into the very insecure jobs, basically doing the same thing, unionization doesn't get there at all. Why is it the case that one small little union, the Independent Workers Union of the UK, 
poorly resourced, is able to take a strategy and breathe life into it and get people in front of tribunals, work and force governments to accept that they are not enforcing their policies. Competition law is not being properly applied. You know, you're absolutely right, Rachel, that we need a whole rethink of what it means uh, to be dominant in a market. The laws that we put in place in the 1930s are completely archaic in terms of their ability to understand uh, real dominance in today's uh, marketplace. So my, my message is we have the laws, we are not applying them. We are choosing to turn a blind eye. And so the insecurity that is being created as a result of these technologies will become a resistance factor so great that we won't enjoy the benefits when we should. So the productivity improvements that we predict will be slow to come. I mean, I, I, I would say on Antonia's side that it's the GMB in unison that brought many of those cases as well. So it's not that the trade union movement has been uh, 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 not, not active. I mean, I agree with every word you say, which is why I'll forgive you for not actually answering the question I asked you. Um, uh, uh, um, Azim, can I ask you to answer the question that I didn't quite answer, which is what does this mean for organisations? I mean, we... We hear lazy assertions that everyone's going to be a freelancer in the future, mm. that hierarchy is dead, all this kind of stuff. And you know, we remember how exciting it was that Google had sofas in the office and stuff like that. Is all that overstated, or are we going to see a fundamental shift in the way in which organizations operate in order to recruit and retain the kind of people, you know, young people with the kind of skills that they want? Well, well if you look at uh, the organizations that we, we think of, the, the, the Googles or the Facebooks or some of the British successes, you know, the, the, the Deliveroo's and the, 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 the Monzo's and TransferWise, they are organized very differently. Uh, and they do uh, set their goals in different ways. They hire in different ways. The nature of the culture is very different. All you need to do is step into one of those offices. And I've spent time with both large companies. Uh, I, I advise a company with more than 400,000 employees uh, that is very old. I've worked in a company that's 170 years old, and I've worked in startups with four or five people. And I can really tell you that the way the hiring is done, the way people are motivated, the way people are given their, their tasks and how they pick them up is distinctly, is distinctly different. And I think it's worth thinking a little bit about what the job of, a, for example, a software developer is within a, one of these high-performing companies, because it does provide a lens. When I describe it to you now, it's going to sound quite attractive. You know, a software developer is somebody who, who's writing the code, but they're constantly learning. Whenever they do a task that's repetitive, they will spend time to write a bit of code to automate their own task so they don't have to work as hard the next time round. They contribute their time, the very best of them, to the projects they love through the open source movement, which puts their work as an intellectual uh, contribution to the public domain. And they're very, very self-directed, right? You can't get a software developer to, do, to develop something he, he or she doesn't want to develop. Those sorts of roles are not particularly commonplace outside of the tech, co tech companies, these newfangled businesses. So they do look very, very different. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's quite hard for old-style companies, the incumbents, as we call them, to compete with some of the new businesses once they, those get some momentum. Rachel, you do a lot of thinking about, about productivity, and um, we, we see the work of the organization Be the Business, which is going around trying to tackle the long tail of low productivity in British businesses. And certainly a core part of their argument is around the quality of management and the quality of people management. How do we kind of overcome this, the, the continuation, this kind of master and servant view of work that we have in Britain, which is considered very odd, I think, when you're in continental Europe, this kind of idea, and move more towards flatter models of organization, better forms of worker engagement, recognizing that's not just a social agenda, but it is a productivity agenda. Mm, yeah, so the work that Charlie Mayfield and uh, Tony Danker are doing with uh, uh, Be The Business I think is really important because it's, it's business-led uh, uh, and, 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 and hopefully will uh, help and inspire and motivate other businesses. I think something like... Um, I don't know, I can't remember the proportion, but if you ask businesses where they are in terms of their productivity, the vast majority say that they are within the top half. Obviously, that cannot be true. Uh, it's like male drivers. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, uh, so 
we need to do more to, to share best practice, but also to share the facts. And some of the work that Andy Haldane, uh, the Bank of England, has done on um, productivity, I think, is really interesting because uh, even within sectors, you've got uh, a small number of companies that are highly productive, and then a long tail of businesses that have very low rates of productivity, uh, and they're competitors in the same uh, in the same sector. And that's the same for pretty much every sector across our economy. So what can we do to, to boost the productivity of those, uh, the, 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 those, those long tails? And how can we do that by sharing um, best practice? I would also say that, you know, again, linking back to, to, to government policy, government policy around the industrial strategy is about announcing sector deals for different sectors of the uh, economy. And the most recent one was on the nuclear sector deal. Uh, last week and the, and, and the construction sector deal, which is, is welcome. But what you see with those is that it, they tend to focus on sectors that are already very productive. But the problem with the sectors that the government focus on is that they employ a relatively small number of people. Now, the real way to get that big boost in productivity that we need is to boost productivity in sectors like uh, uh, retail, in hospitality, in social care, and I don't just mean by um, making everyone work harder, but making people work smarter and improving the quality of the service that people are, are delivering. And you see in other countries a higher levels of productivity within those sectors. So if you take uh, uh, many uh, uh, um, European countries, uh, for example, I think in Germany, uh, most people who work in the social care sector have a nursing qualification. You don't see that in the social care system uh, in this country. So boosting productivity is not just about getting people to see uh, more patients or look after more people. It's about boosting the number of things that the people working in the sector can do, about reducing the turnover in the, uh, the, the sector and improving the quality uh, of the care. And I think government focusing on those small number of um, already quite highly productive but low uh, employment sectors is missing a trick. Because if the government put as much effort into the low productivity, low skill but high employment sectors of the economy, that's the way we could really see our productivity uh, boosted because, and, and why do we want higher productivity? Because we want higher wages for workers. And again, if you uh, boost productivity in those high employment sectors of the economy, you're more likely to see that filter through to the wage rates. Great, thank you. Um, Antonio, I mean, one of the difficult challenges for trade unions is that your core narrative is about protecting people from you know, bad experiences and bad employers. But actually, a lot of what the trade union movement does is working in partnership with good employers and we were hearing this afternoon, the event we were at, somebody said, you know, actually there are two ways you can work in a warehouse. You can work in a warehouse and it can be oppressive and unpleasant and bullying and nobody wants to do it for more than a few weeks, but you can work in a warehouse where actually there is some job progression. You are respected. So talk about the role of trade unions in, in making good work, working with employers. Um, well... Um, I, think, I think it's absolutely right uh, to focus on the way that we can create the jobs that we want people to be able to do. And it certainly is the case that we don't have to have jobs that, at the bottom of our labour market that are always poorly paid, that are always offering few opportunities for progression mm. and that offer few decent terms and conditions and benefits alongside them. I think uh, you would expect me to say this, uh, but I think uh, the route to improving those jobs comes when working people have a voice uh, and when working people are able to articulate that voice collectively. They're not bearing the brunt as individuals, but they can articulate that voice together, um, not through an employee forum where they can be uh, consulted, uh, but nothing necessarily has to happen, but in a way where they can sit as equal partners represented around the table uh, with the bosses, uh, negotiate on equal terms, and come out with an outcome that works for everybody. Um, for me, that, can, that, that means uh, getting, going through a recognised trade union and getting more trade union recognitions uh, around the country is it, the aim of our trade union movement. It's not just about membership, because actually what delivers the transformative benefits of trade unionism is working in a unionised workplace where you have those collective bargaining rights. Uh, and so that's the priority of our trade union movement now, to get more good jobs and more good workplaces 
through collective bargaining in recognised workplaces. And Moy is right to give us a challenge. Why are we not doing more um, uh, to get more private sector workers, particularly young workers, into trade unions? And I think this has to be the mission of the trade union movement. We're 150 the TUC this year, uh, and I know my boss is going to set out in her annual remarks, uh, her speech at Congress in the autumn, uh, our plans to make sure that we really bring a new generation of young workers into trade unionism. There are good bright spots. We've heard about some of the legal cases that our unions have won over Hermes, over Uber. Um, we've heard about uh, Unison's historic reversal of bringing in employment tribunal fees from the last government. Um, it was great to see one of the most anti-union companies out there, Ryanair, forced to recognize Unite for cabin crew and Balpa for their pilots. And I know that that, need, that, that that requirement to bargain is beginning to bear fruit for those Ryanair staff that stepped out bravely, put their hands up in that anti-union company and said, no, we want to be in a union. Our movement needs to do more, though, which is why our general counsel two years ago gave me the challenge of setting up a digital trade union for 21 to 30s. We did 18 months of research, uncovered lots of barriers to trade unionism. And on the fourth, a uh, couple of prototypes, on the 4th of June, which was our 150th birthday, we launched the pilot. It's called WorkSmart, and it's a platform that doesn't necessarily shout trade union from the moment you look at it. It talks about progression in work, getting on in life, which was exactly what these young workers told us they wanted, and which, of course, is part of the historic mission of trade unionism. We've always taught people to read and write. We've always been a platform for working class people to rise, and we should be that again. Great, thank you. So um, my one question has taken up all the time for questions from me. So we'll now open it up to the floor. What I'll do is I'll take kind of three or four questions together if I can and ask you. Panel, don't try and respond to every point. Just pick one or two points that you want to respond to. Okay, and there's a microphone winging its way towards you, sir. Uh, Alec Robertson, a um, fellow. Uh, the word productivity is thrown around quite a bit. It's financially based. Is there a need for two scales? One is productivity that's financially based, and the other is productivity which is well-being and contentment based. And all institutions and companies should have to measure themselves on both scales and show it transparently. Good, thank you. Uh, and then here. I'm David Wood from London Futurist. My question builds on the previous one. I wanted to ask if whether good work in the new machine age means employees working fewer hours on the whole, more time for sabbaticals, more time for early retirement or semi-retirement, rather than just focusing on let's have more wages, please. Okay, and then right at the back of the room. London. Um, I've been doing research with industry, so it's kind of academia, industry, partnerships. And we have got quite solid scientific results that would uh, support the definition of productivity. That Don't the colleague... point with your microphone holding, oh, oh, sorry. Microphone holding <laughs> yeah. hand. Little... The, uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> the uh, definition of, new definition of productivity, not actually how much money do we make out of get, selling so many shoes. Technology actually gives you the opportunity to look at the, how individuals appropriate that technology. And in, in our, we've got solid body of scientific research to suggest that saying technology will not make things cheaper but if you give the people right to adopt the technology, it will make them better. And that's not a social, it's a, there is a, an economic case waiting to be defined out of that, uh, out of that uh, scientific research. Is there any possibility of actually forming a group of people who will make that economic case? Very good, could be the RSA, who knows. Mm -hmm. um, and then over there. Amy, very quick question. You talk about the uh, privileged as well as the, uh, I was going to say persecuted, the, the lower end. Uh, do we know enough about the privileged? Because if we treat non-permanent employees as just this monolithic group, are we at risk of making wrong policy, including tax decisions, when many of those people are driving the machine age? Great, thank you. So, uh, Pat, we've got a question about productivity. We've got a question about shouldn't the goal be fewer uh, hours. We've got a question about whether or not the very way we're thinking about technology and productivity is, 
is wrong. We need a new economics for this. And then we've got this kind of, isn't it important to distinguish between the privileged and the precariat, as I think the Resolution Foundation, uh, that, was the, that was what you were thinking. That was the dichotomy you were searching for, sir, wasn't it? Um, okay, uh, just take one or two of those points so we can have one more round of questions before we finish. Uh, Antonio. Um, so uh, I'm going to come in on David's question on ours and yes as you heard me say uh, traditionally we want the benefits of increased productivity in either or both increased wages and fewer hours work that's how we won the weekend um, my colleagues over in IG Metall in Germany um, in their steelworks have um, have just negotiated a groundbreaking agreement that enable, enables their workers there uh, to go down to 30 or 25 hours a week with a commensurate cut in pay for a period of time and then go back up to full time. And that's, as you would expect, who work, the majority of workers in that still works are male workers. Uh, they're men, uh, but they wanted that because they wanted to be more involved in their children's lives, but also in the other responsibilities, in leisure time activities outside of work. That sort of agreement is, it shows exactly the sort of direction unions should be going in. New tech in that industry gave the possibility of reduced hours um, whilst ha reserving that right to go back up to full-time hours in the future. And that's a really exemplar of the way that I think we should be going when we're thinking about how we negotiate on behalf of workers to share the benefits. Rachel, I know as a politician it's incumbent upon you to answer every question, but just pick one. Yeah. Um, so I think that the, the, the issue is about the power um, and, and who has the power. And it's up to people to decide, families to decide, individuals to decide in an ideal world how many hours they want to work and how many hours of leisure they want. The problem is, is that at both ends of the spectrum, too many people don't have the choice. So there's a lot of people who are working zero-hour contracts who don't earn enough because they haven't got enough hours. And at the other end of the spectrum, you've got people working for some of the tech platforms who are uh, um, encouraged, stroke forced, uh, to work more hours than they want to or risk losing uh, access to, to, that, uh, to that platform. And so I think this is not about a, a, an either-or thing. It's about changing the power dynamics within workplaces so people can choose what is right for them. But in, I represent constituency in Leeds where average earnings are £19,000 uh, a year. Uh, what most people want is to be able to earn more, to be able to support themselves and their family, but also to be able to spend time with their family. And too many people uh, don't have either. They don't have that time with their family or the time when they choose it but they're also not earning enough as well and so um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm all for people being able to take more leisure time uh, uh, but it, I think ultimately it's about where the power lies and my worries about this future world of work that we're talking about uh, this evening is that too much power is shifting uh, to those who are already powerful and being taken away from uh, um, the, the precarious or the persecuted as Jamie referred to them. Right. Matthew, I'd like to take up this uh, notion of well-being, and is there not a different way of looking at productivity? I, I'm not the person who can solve that, having never done an economic, economics course in my life, but I think there is something in that. If we could find a way to link how people feel and how much happier they are and how that links to you know, general uh, health and how that might link to better outcomes in other sectors of the economy. I think there's something there. Good employers, I should tell you, have been caring about well-being for a very long time. And in fact, the roots of good employment going, you know, right back to the Cadburys and the Roundtrees in this country, when I started reading about it, it was all about well-being. And so um, we do care about well-being. We probably don't measure it as part of productivity. And the other thing I'd like to say is that yeah, we do have to turn our minds to what life is like for the privileged, but I don't think with you know, limited time for uh, legislative agendas that that should be the focal point. They can look after themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, very, very briefly, uh, you know, GDP is, is one of those institutions that we can, we can look back historically and say, well, you know, we focused on it, but we didn't think about our carbon budget, we didn't think about inequality, we didn't think about a 40-year trend of a value going to capital rather than, than, than labour. Um, these are the sorts of institutions, they include things like IP law and tax law and how we treat monopolies, that, need, that I do believe need to be reinvented over the next five years or so because they're not fit for purpose for the information age even though they served us very, very well during the industrial age. 
So, um, because I promised Azim that we wouldn't, he wouldn't miss the beginning of the football match, and I'm a man who sticks to his commitment, what I'm going to do, I'm afraid, is rather than taking another question, I'm just one last question. You've got to answer in one sentence. I'll start with you, Azim. Okay. Uh, if you had to have one policy, one policy which you think is necessary for the new wo the world we are moving into of massive technological change impacting people's jobs, what would be the single policy that you think would make the biggest contribution to getting this right? We have to be able to pay for our policies, so that means we need a stable tax base. So we need to change our tax system, recognizing that companies have got all sorts of ways to squirrel away their value uh, without the exchequer getting a look, at, look into it. And that may mean moving away from income taxes towards something else. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Moya. I agree with that, but I also think enforce the laws you've got. Because if you did enforce the laws that you have, you would find that these business models that are atrocious would start to fall away. Very good. So uh, corporate tax enforcement, Rachel? I think break up monopolies and cartels so that workers have got more choice over where they can work and consumers have got more choice over where they buy things from. Very good. Antonio? Um, so the policy I would choose, I would bring in modern wages councils uh, for some of our lowest paying sectors, starting with hospitality, retail and social care, mm -hmm. um, make them partnership bodies between government employers, all of the employers in that sector and trade unions and give them the power to negotiate le legally binding wages, terms and conditions floor and skills floor for the people in those industries. Thank you. Now, I, um, there's this gentleman in the back of the room, he's had his arm up for so long, I feel that I, I'm not going to get them to answer your question, but make the point you want to make because I feel so sorry for you with your sore arm. But briefly, briefly. Very briefly, uh, say thank you to Moya Green, I'm from the IWGB union. Ah. And uh, I'm a claimant in the Uber case. I'm proud that uh, IWGB supported me in that. And I have two observations, and I would like to know if the panel agrees from that experience. Number one, the Uber platform didn't create bad work. It consolidated the misery. Minicab industry has always been rotten, and we didn't enforce the law then, and we don't enforce the law now. The second is that policymakers are conflicted. And that's why the law is not being enforced, because we want the benefits, the consumer benefits of Uber, but we don't want to protect the workers who are being abused in that system. Those are my observations, and I'd love your reaction. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. You will get a reaction from the panel if they're able to stay behind and join us for a glass of wine downstairs. You are all invited to stay uh, on and carry on this conversation. It's been an absolutely fascinating hour. We've, we've just touched on the service. Now, a couple of other things. Before you leave, I will get you to the kickoff. Um, before you leave, uh, if you want to know more about the RSA's work on the future work, I strongly recommend an article uh, written um, by Benedict Dellert, which is on the RSA website now, isn't it, Ben? Very good. Uh, ben would have been up here today, but he's not been very well. But that's a brilliant article about all of these issues, so please read that article. If you want to know more about the RSA's work on future work, it'll be on our website. We engage all our fellows in our work, so if you're interested in the future of work and AI and all this stuff, and you're not a fellow, then talk to a member of staff about becoming an RSA fellow and be part of our movement for change. But last, um, I, as part of this Future um, of Work uh, program, we're using tonight the launch of our centre to launch a further initiative to promote uh, good work, which is the Future Work Awards. Uh, and I'd like to ask Charlie Ledbetter to join us on stage to say a, a very brief few words about the Future Work Awards. Charlie, over to you. Uh, yeah, the Future Work Awards, which we're launching tonight, is very simple, uh, which is that there's a kind of wave of pessimism and learned helplessness about work, uh, of people fearing robots, that diverting us from glaring inequalities and precarity. And actually, alongside that, there's a mass of innovation going on that isn't recognized uh, of the kind that we saw mentioned here. But it could be about voice and organization at work, so the work that Antonia's doing or the uh, independent workers of Great Britain. It could be training and upskilling. Uh, an organization called Freeformers, for instance, is doing that. It could be in job matching, economic security, new models of how employers work. So what we're interested in is people who've got inspiring, uplifting, and innovative approaches to helping people shape good work from all over the world. And we'll be gathering these over the course of the next few months and launching our initial awards in October to help promote a sense that actually work can be shaped for the better and that there are lots and lots of people trying to do that now. Great. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you.
So uh, do please keep up to date with the Future Work Centre's work and uh, the Future Work Awards. All that remains for me now to say is please do join us downstairs for a glass of wine. The football will be on in the background and give a big hand to Antonia, Moya, Rachel and Azim. Thank you. <laughs>